I want to talk to you this evening um, about a subject that's become really dear to my own heart, which is the fact that God has a totally undivided heart. And um, key number one <laughs> is <clears throat> we change when we see God's unchanging heart. We change the most when we see God's unchanging heart. Many of us, sadly, have grown up in a religious system that almost perpetrates the idea that God is bipolar. You know, that he loves us, but he's angry with us. What's that about? That God, that, that God looks at our behavior, and if it's not good, he turns away from us. If you're hearing stuff like that in your local church, you need to know that it's, it's a religious spirit that's talking to you. It's one of the biggest problems, I think, in the Western church is false doctrine and poor teaching. But you know, things are changing. Things are changing. There is a spirit, a wonderful, um, majestic spirit of wisdom and revelation that's doing the rounds around the world right now. And God is opening us up to kingdom truth, which I think is a higher version than some of the church truth that we've been listening to. There is a kingdom truth that takes into account everything that God is and everything that we are not and blends the two together because God does not have an undivided heart about any of us. He has a full heart. And because he has a full heart towards us, we can have a full assurance of understanding of who we are in him, how we connect with him, how we fit with him. It's marvelous stuff. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8. And the Lord says, in Malachi 3.6, he says, I am the Lord, and I change not. I don't think he was talking about diapers. <laughs> I change not. He's just saying, this is the one that you're dealing with. You're dealing with the one person in the universe who never, ever changes. So you always know where you are with him. On your best day and on your worst day, he's exactly the same. He never changes. And I think he likes that about himself, <laughs> that he never changes. <clears throat> James put it this way. <coughs> Excuse me. He said, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shifting shadow or variation. God doesn't switch things up on you. He lets you know exactly, hey, this is who I am, just so you know, and I'll always be like this, just so you know, and you can become confident in who I am towards you, because I won't change on you. So what we see in the nature of God gives us confidence in all our dealings with him. And, and I love the fact that because his character doesn't change, his promises, um, his word to us is also eternally sacred. So in... Um, in Numbers chapter uh, 23, verses 19 and 20, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He doesn't do anything that he's sorry for. Has he said and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a commandment to bless 
And when he has blessed, it cannot be revoked. Isn't that amazing? His word is absolutely true and sure. In Isaiah 55, uh, 11, Isaiah put it this way. He said, this is the word he received from the Lord. So will my word be that goes out from my presence, from my mouth. It will not return to me empty it will, without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. You know, there are words coming to us from heaven in these days. And the whole point of God prophetically communicating to us, whether he's using the prophecy of Scripture or whether he's using the prophetic gift, the whole point is that we should succeed with the words that he's giving us. That we take those words and they become a focal point for our success in the arenas of life, on the battlefields of life, anywhere, they work and they work perfectly because God doesn't lie and he never changes. The word of the Lord stands forever. And in Isaiah 45, let me read this to you, verse 23. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. I love that. My word is not going to turn back. So the fascinating thing about the word of the Lord is it depends on his character, not yours. Depends on his nature, not yours. Depends on who he is, not who you are. And the fact that we can come and find the place of shelter in who God is, we can hide under the shadow of his wing, and that counts for everything with him. It's not about you being brilliant. It's about him being amazing. And you will not become brilliant because you get your act together. You will become brilliant when you realize how amazing he is and how he never changes and how he includes you in him. So if one of his names is wonderful, then wonderful has to be your name. We get to be who he is and we have all the help in the world for that to happen. He swears by himself. And one of my current, uh, for the last few years, favorite um, promises because um, I have a life-threatening health condition, Yahoo. (laughs) I am not a sick man trying to get well. I'm a whole man fighting off sickness. But, you know, my doctors are concerned and all that kind of stuff, which is really sweet of them. I appreciate it. (laughs) But this is my promise from the Father. And so this, for me, is sacred to me. And and I'm going to read it out because I, I just have a sense that there are people here who are in a similar situation, and this might want to be a promise that you borrow. Yeah? And it's from Isaiah 46. And this is his promise to me. Verse 3, You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I will be the same. And even to your graying hairs, I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you, and I will bear you, and I will deliver you. See, a promise is everything to God, and therefore it's everything to us. 
promise from God is often like the difference between life and death. But a promise is something that God gives us because He doesn't change. Therefore, when you come and rest and stand on that promise, then all the confidence that God has in His Word comes to you. I like that. God's heart and nature is unchanging towards us. He's put us into Christ and Christ into us to make us feel doubly secure in His loving kindness to us. So when life is unstable, Jesus is the only constant. His nature is the foundation of all trust. He is unfailingly good. And he's the one who says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Unchanging, constant. And it's his nature that provides us with the revelatory insights that influence our whole identity and our personality. So radical permission number one is it is the unchanging heart and the unchanging word that becomes the place where you can stand in absolute confidence in the goodness of God towards you regardless of circumstances. Who God is, is therefore more important to you than the circumstances you're in. Key number two, it's impossible for the Father to see you disconnected from love. You see, because He's unchanging, He has included you in the Son of His love, and He doesn't ever see that changing. Because that would mean that He would have to change, and He's just not available for change. So when He puts you into Jesus, He puts you into the unchanging nature of God. What does that really mean? Nothing depends on what you do. That's that whole religious thing again, is it makes everything dependent upon our performance. We are going to cut the head off that monster one day. <clears throat> nothing you do no, depends on you. It does, nothing depends on you. Everything depends on who God is. You don't get things from God because of your behavior. You get them because of your placement in Jesus. You get them because He is one. Right? We may be struggling to be one with God. God is not struggling to be one with us. Right? He is not struggling. He's not going, oh, that Graham, dear Lord. If I had a God, I would pray to him right now about that one. <laughs> You're not doing that. <laughs> Let me read you something brilliant from the Bible. It's in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? What does that mean? It means you can't even be against yourself. I know you've tried it. <laughs> I know. I hear stuff. You can't even be against yourself successfully because he won't stand for it. He's for you. Get over your bad self. I'm sure you will. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all how will he not also with him freely give us all things? You need at least to be asking the Lord the question, so uh, 
This all things stuff, what does that mean for me? That's a good question. He would love to answer that question. What are the all things that you need right now in your circumstances? You know, the only reason you have circumstances is because God wants to give you stuff. So he creates circumstances. He allows in his wisdom what he could easily prevent by his power. He allows circumstances because he wants to give you stuff. See, that was wonderfully eloquent right there. <laughs> stuff. He wants to give you things, yeah? How will he not also with him freely give us all things? He uses the term all things because he uses all kinds of situations to give us all things. So you don't have any situation in your life that cannot receive something from the Lord because that would not be true to who he is, yeah? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. It's like the Lord is standing in front of you saying, anybody wants to accuse my Graham right now, you've got to come through me, right? Anybody who wants to come after you has to come through him. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You know, the one who knows us best, loves us best, and is praying for us. It's like heads you win and tails you win bigger. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Retrospective question, the answer is nothing separates us from the love of God. Not even you. Not even our stupidity can separate us from the love of God. Not even the church we belong to can separate us from the love of God. <laughs> Listen to this though, this is amazing. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Come on, when was the last time you overwhelmingly conquered something? Last Tuesday? In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. I think Paul's pretty serious about this. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's really important for us that we settle that issue once and for all time. God does not have an undivided heart about you. He knows exactly how he sees you, exactly how he feels about you. He knows exactly what he wants to be for you. And he's never going to deviate from that primary purpose of making you like him. What does that mean? We get to become as unchanging as he is. But the journey into that is we come to a place deliberately where we have an unchanging sense of who God is for us. And we totally, 1,000% relax. We rest in the nature of God. 
and we let all that performance thing leave us. You know, performance is important. Ask any athlete. Ask any actor. Ask any singer. Performance is important. Ask any hedge fund manager. Performance is important. But in the realm of the Spirit, in Christ, performance comes after God has done something, not before. Performance comes after relationship, not in order to get a relationship. Performance comes because of who God is for us. We respond to that. Yeah? So our performance as Christians is simply to respond to all that God wants to be and do for each of us. It's not to earn anything. It's just to receive and celebrate all that God is. We are accepted in the beloved. And we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. So the goal of the Holy Spirit is an utter conviction in our hearts regarding the faithfulness of God. So Paul put it this way in his letter to Timothy, to Timothy 1.12. He said, I know whom I have believed, and I am fully persuaded that he is able to guard and keep what I have entrusted to him. So the journey that we're on, the story that we're all writing right now in our lives is that we have come to a place of being fully persuaded and nobody and nothing is going to talk me out of this place. God isn't talking us out of anything. He's talking us into something in Him. And so a conviction is a firmly held belief fully persuaded. We believe it implicitly. We have full assurance of understanding. We have a certainty in our hearts and an absolute reliance on the truth about the nature of God. We have a conviction that love covers a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8. You cannot have a perception of yourself that partners with the flesh. We are developing convictions that connect us to all that God is for us in Jesus. So we are chosen in Christ to receive the unconditional love of the Father through Jesus. John 59 says that Just as, in other words, in the same way that the Father has loved me, says Jesus, so have I loved you. I love you in the same way that I am loved. So the Father put us into Christ so he could love us the same way that he loves Jesus. That's gold. That's the most precious thing about us and it's the thing that we should treasure the most so who are you well my name is Graham and God loves me exactly the way that he loves Jesus that's my story I just walk around the earth sometimes I fly until my (laughs) arms hurt and everywhere I go I feel this incredible love that the father has for me because he put me into Jesus. You know, he loves me exactly like he loves Jesus. That's precious to me. This is what Jesus said about it in John 17, verse 20. He said this, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. 
It's in the Bible. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. I think that's probably the most important message that we can give people. Is that the Father loves us exactly in the same way that he loves Jesus. And every day, in every situation, we are celebrating that truth. I am incredibly and wonderfully loved. And there's nothing special about me. I have my days of brilliance. I have my days of lunacy. I have my days when the spirit of stupid is following me around all day. But he still loves me exactly the same because he doesn't change. He doesn't have a divided heart. 